So it seems you all really liked my last year-end retrospective, and I gotta admit, it was a lot of fun to do. So screw it! Let's do it again! Okay! So logically, if I wanted to do each and every year of the game, we'd start back in 2002, right? But here's the thing. I don't want to do that. To be honest, the DM era of the TCG is so heavily covered by so many people, including myself, that there really isn't anything worth recapping especially since most of the things that happened over the course of its three years is roughly equivalent to a single year now. If you want a recap of everything that happened between the game's launch in 2002 and the rough end of the DM era in 2004, I'd heavily recommend Swag Kage or Ribbendale's video on the topic, as it's extremely in-depth, thorough with testimony from players of the time, and I truly don't think I could do any better. It's just an all-around amazing piece of documentative work for the game we all love. We're actually going to start ourselves in 2005, where the DM era was wrapping up and the GX era was just around the corner. So let's not waste any time and jump right in. Dragon's Roar and Zombie Madness. Release date, January 1st, 2005. Set type, Structured X. Major strategies, Dragons, Zombies. Impact, Staple reprints. The year of 2005 was started off with an action that would eventually become a staple of the game's release schedule, the first ever structured X. Dragon's Roar and Zombie Madness would only bring a couple of new cards to the pool, specifically in Red Eyes Darkness Dragon for Dragon's Roar and Vampire Genesis for Zombie Madness, neither of which were powerful enough in the current format of early 2005 to even be remotely worth running. However, these decks did bring something incredibly important to the longevity of the game, that being extremely accessible reprints of meta staples up until this point. Snatch Deal, Mystical Space Typhoon, Nobleman of Crossout, Premature Burial, Pot of Greed, Heavy Storm, Giant Trunade, Call of the Haunted, Torrential Tribute, and Compulsory Evacuation Device were all reprinted between these decks, making all of them far easier to obtain to the average player. As most had not seen a reprint outside of a specific reprint released back in late 2004, being Dark Beginning 1. This time period was also extremely important for the beginnings of the first big circuit of high-profile tournaments in Yu-Gi-Oh, being the Shonen Jump Championship Series, otherwise known as the SJCs, which were technically started at the end of 2004 with SJC Anaheim, but truly came into its own at the start of 2005 with SJC Las Vegas, Columbus, and Orlando all happening within a few weeks of each other. SJC Vegas took place on February 8th of 2005, and though we do not have much information on the tournaments of this time period, we do have information on both the winners and the runners-up thanks to the old Konami blog entries. For Vegas, Wilson Luke would win the event with a Chaos Warrior Brew, which you'll come to find was very standard at the time, as almost every deck would run the same package of meta-defining staples up until that point, comprising over half of practically any topping deck list. Second place was Ian Wingrove on Beast Down, which we do not have a complete deck list of, but we do have enough to get an idea of how aggressive his particular build was, aiming at winning battles early and often. SJC Columbus would take place a week later on February 13th, 2005, and would bring a lot of the same. Patrick Smith would take home the gold here with Chaos Warrior, while Gustavo Reyes would take second place with a Creator Chaos list that we, again, don't have the full list of, which is going to be a very common factor through a lot of these, as this is a very old set of data that we're working with. Lastly for this block, SJC Orlando took place two weeks later on February 27th of 2005, and once again, Chaos would win the day, with Andrew Fridella taking home the gold, and more importantly for these tournaments, the first place prize card. For all of the early SJCs, the first place finisher would receive a prize card that was exclusive for the time being to the SJC circuit, being Cyberstein, who could pay 5,000 life points to special summon a fusion from the fusion deck. This at the time was a highly sought after monster, but purely for the status of owning one thanks to its prize card status, as there was no fusion at the time worth paying over half of your life points to summon out when magical scientists could cheat out arguably the most relevant one, Thousand Eyes Restrict, for only a thousand. For Cyberstein to be relevant meta-wise, it would need a much better target, or targets, to summon. For now though, these tournaments would establish the meta of the time following the previous October ban list as one dominated by Chaos and the various powerful warrior monsters, and the next set did not look like it was going to be changing that fact. Flaming Eternity. Release date? March 1st, 2005. Set type, Core Set. 
Major Strategies, Neftis, Beasts. Impact, Future Format Staples. Flaming Eternity is a set whose era placement is in a bit of a strange limbo state, as it's either at the tail end of the DM era, where it would be the only set in the entire era without Yugi on the packaging at all, or it's the beginning of the GX era, where none of the cards that are in it are recognizable to the GX anime, and even some cards are directly tied to the original anime. Regardless, Flaming Eternity did bring a couple of interesting new pieces to the metagame, but nothing so powerful as to upend the entire format. The cover card and main boss monster of the set was clearly Sacred Phoenix of Neftis, a 2400 attack wing beast that would revive itself in the owner's next standby phase when it was destroyed by a card effect, nuking all spells and traps when it did. Neftis would see experimentation with some players thanks to its ease of access through Hand of Neftis, who could tribute itself and another monster to summon it from the deck. But its long-term staying power was put into question by the chaos-dominated metagame, as there was no shortage of ways to remove Neftis without destroying it by card effect. The far more prevalent theme of the set were beast monsters, with cards like Behemoth, the king of all animals, Maji Geyer Panda, Beast Soul Swap, and probably the most iconic of all of the beasts in this set, Rescue Cat, who could send itself to grave from field to summon two level 3 or lower beasts from the deck, but destroyed them during the end phase. At the time, the errata to negate their effects was not present on this card, and Rescue Cat was recognized fairly quickly for its potential. The ability to summon out two of any of the low-leveled beasts from the deck held serious potential. However, the beast pool at the time was a good bit lacking, with its main application being summoning out Gyakugair Panda and Milus Radiant for quick and easy damage. Rescue Cat's summon pool could only grow from here, which kept this particular card in a bit of a position of interest moving into the later eras of the game. Aside from these, there were also many powerful standalone cards that would shape different aspects of the format. Grand Marg the Rock Monarch was the latest monarch added to the pool, whose effect was a lot more specific than any of the other monarchs that came before it, destroying a set card, but could be used against spells, traps, and monsters. It wouldn't see as much play as Mobius due to only hitting one and specifically hitting sets, but it would pop up from time to time. Arm Samurai Benkai was another interesting piece that could enable its own deck focused around powerful equipped spells to enable OTKs, which would see some mild experimentation in its time but no long-term success. Golem Sentry would become yet another piece of good flip monster disruption, able to bounce a monster on flip summon and able to flip itself face down once per turn. Lightning Vortex was seen as a less powerful version of Raigeki, which was now banned, able to discard a card to destroy all face-up monsters from the opponent's field. Threatening Roar would see experimentation as it effectively let the user stall for a turn and was activatable in response to removal. Phoenix Wing Wind Blast was comparable to Raigeki Break, taking the same discard costs and having the same target requirements, but rather than destroying the target, it placed it on top of the owner's deck, which was useful in some cases where Raigeki Break was not. Good Goblin Housekeeping was an extremely odd card, as initially it's a card swap in hand, but when used with other copies of itself could turn into a plus one in total. Lastly, Deck Devastation Virus was a new, extremely targeted counter card, where you could tribute a 2000 attack or higher dark monster to destroy all 1500 or lower attack monsters the opponent controlled, in their hand, and all that they draw for the next three turns. Not being super popular on release, but seeing the occasional side deck play for certain strategies. Flaming Eternity did change some factors of the format with new generic staples overall, but nothing so groundbreaking as to upend the status quo, leading into the second ever reprint set printed in the TCG, and whether it would be as well received as the first was still up in the air. Dark Revelation Volume 1 Release Date March 19th, 2005. Set type, reprint set. Major strategies, the staples of late 2003. Impact, lowering the barrier to entry. Revelations 1 may have only been the second ever reprint set, but it essentially took what Beginnings 1 did and did it again with the later sets. Most cards originally printed between Pharaonic Guardian and Dark Crisis were reprinted here, meaning meta staples like Breaker the Magical Warrior, DD Warrior Lady, Magical Scientist, Tribe Infecting Virus, and various other cards from late 2003 were made more readily available. This would also be accompanied by a bandless update less than two weeks later to address the ever-centralizing meta that had been growing since the death of Chaos Control, and this particular bandless is very well known in the community for other reasons. Newly banned were Fiberjar, Magical Scientist, Makura the Destructor, Butterfly Dagger Elma, Change of Heart, Confiscation, 
Mirage of Nightmare, Painful Choice, and The Forceful Century, all being cards that either extremely promoted one-sided advantage generation, FTKs, or were generally just not desired to have in a healthy metagame. This is also noticeable as this was only the second batch of bans in the game's history, as the previous ban list had been the original one that removed CED and Yada from the game. Newly limited were DD Warrior Lady, Sacred Phoenix of Nethys, Sangan, Delinquent Duo, Graceful Charity, Lightning Vortex, United We Stand, Deck Devastation Virus, and Mirror Force, some of which were banned on the previous list while others had formed a new meta landscape since the last banned list, specifically in DD Warrior Lady, who was a 2 to 3 of in practically every list since the last banned list. Newly semi limited were Abyss Soldier, Dark Scorpion Chick the Yellow, Night Assailant, Vampire Lord, Emergency Provisions, Level Limit Area B, Upstart Goblin, Good Goblin Housekeeping, and Gravity Bind, limiting some of the cheekier interactions of some cards like Chick and Assailant, as well as the floodgate nature of cards like Level Limit and Gravity Bind. Lastly, Morphing Jar 2 was removed from the list, as its effect compared to the other Jar cards was far less impactful, although this would lead to a resurgence in decks focused around the Jars specifically. SJC Los Angeles would take place directly after this list took effect on April 2, 2005, and with the hits to Chaos Warrior now in effect, a new variant of Chaos would be on display here with first place Eric Wu's Zombie Chaos, which replaced the previous Warrior package with Pyramid Turtle and Vampire Lord. Keenson Yi's second place list would also heavily feature the same Zombie Core, although it would feature a Neptis package rather than a Chaos Core, showing the Chaos Core was not absolutely required anymore, but it was still a powerful option nonetheless. SJC Houston would be just a few weeks later on April 30th, 2005, and first place would go to Ryan Hayakama on a particularly aggressive deck simply known as Beatdown, which looked to play all of the Chaos Warrior staples up until this point alongside a single copy of Berserk Gorilla to easily win early combats. Second would go to Thirizak Punsombat on Warrior, but interestingly enough, both decks were running extremely similar lists, even though they are listed as completely different strategies. This would lead into the second set of structure decks released shortly after, and many looked to them to see if they would bring anything new to shake up this increasingly centralized metagame. Blaze of Destruction and Fury from the Deep. Release date, May 9th, 2005. Set type, Structure Decks. Major Strategies, Fire and Water. Impact, Monarchs for All. Blaze of Destruction and Fury from the Deep were very similar in nature to Dragon's Roar and Zombie Madness in that the one new card each that they brought would have no meta impact whatsoever, being Infernal Flame Emperor and Blaze of Destruction and Ocean Dragon Lord Neo Daedalus and Fury from the Deep. However, like the previous structure decks, they provided easy access copies of staples up until this point, like Snatch Deal, Mystical Space Typhoon, Nobleman of Crossout, Premature Burial, Pot of Greed, Heavy Storm, Call of the Haunted, and Torrential Tribute. However, each of these decks brought one additional reprint that would actually make some waves due to making each affordable. Blaze of Destruction reprinted Thestalos the Firestorm Monarch, and Fury from the Deep reprinted Mobius the Frost Monarch the two arguably best Monarch monsters at this point in their first easy access reprint ever, and they were included with each deck purchased. This was enough to get the two decks to sell, but still did nothing to shake up the metagame. However, a new era was on the horizon, and as June began, so did the official start of the next era of Yu-Gi-Oh! The Lost Millennium Release date, June 1st, 2005. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Elemental Hero, Ancient Gear, Rocks. Impact, the start of something new. The Lost Millennium is where most people believe the GX era officially starts, which makes the most sense as one of its headlining features is the reintroduction of archetypes to Yu-Gi-Oh! While there had been some archetypes previously, such as Gravekeepers and Amazonists, this set is where the modern expression of archetype design begins making a series of monsters that have a commonality between them to centralize their strategy and make specific support for just that subset of cards. The perfect example of this is the Elemental Hero series, which was also the main archetype used by Jaden Yuki, the main character of the GX anime, as a series of monsters whose primary gimmick is being able to fuse with each other to make various fusions for different situations. While their first wave was extremely limiting, bringing only the four main deck normal monsters, Flame Wingman, 
Thunder Giant, and a couple of support pieces like Hero Signal, Elemental Hero would grow from here to become a staple of the GX era sets. A similar situation could be applied to the other major archetype here in Ancient Gears, used by Dr. Crowler in the GX anime, a series of Earth Machine monsters that stun the ability to activate spells and traps when they attack, with Ancient Gear Soldier having that be its only effect, Beast, who negates the effects of monsters it destroys in battle, and the set headliner, Golem, who deals piercing damage on top of its stun effect. Ancient Gear would not break into the meta with this wave, but similar to Elemental Hero would continue to see support trickle out over the course of the era. The last major strategy that seemed to be present in this set was a focus on rock monsters, boosting the previous reflip strategy a bit with a couple of smaller monsters in Guardian Statue, who had a similar effect to Sentry Golem from earlier, Medusa Worm, who destroyed monsters instead of bouncing them, and a couple of new boss monsters in Hero Cross Sphinx, who prevented face down monsters from being attacked, Cryo Sphinx, who hand ripped a card any time a monster is bounced, and most importantly, Mega Rock Dragon, a monster who can be special summoned by banishing all rocks from the grave and gain 700 attack and defense for each. Some of the rocks here like Medusa, Guardian, and Mega Rock would go on to see experimentation alongside other flip and reset monsters, but in terms of major success these would not be meta defining threats. As for standalone cards of interest, DD Survivor returned to the field anytime it's banished from the field, which could be seen as a counter to the current banishing warrior threats. Death Wombat completely walled off effect damage, seeing side deck play for that effect. King of the Skull Servants gained a thousand attack for each of itself or Skull Servant in your graveyard, spawning a niche deck off of it. And Brain Control, which could pay 800 life points to steal an opponent's face up monster for the turn, seemingly designed as a more balanced change of heart. All of these new introductions would be legal for the summer SJC events, starting with SJC New Jersey on June 11th of 2005. First and second place respectively would be claimed by previous SJC winners Ryan Hayakawa and Wilson Luke, being on Chaos Warriors and a Chaos Flip toolbox respectively. Both players would be on a combo that would become far more recognizable for this particular format over the next few tournaments, that being Metamorphosis alongside a quick play spell known as Scapegoat which summons zero attack and defense tokens to chump block hits for you. By using Metamorphosis on a sheep token, you could summon out Thousand Eyes Restrict from the fusion deck without losing it at the end of the turn like with Magical Scientist, which quickly became one of the most powerful things you could be doing in the format. This flip toolbox over the next few months would take on a new name as Goat Control, and from this, the term for this particular point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, known as Goat Format, would be coined, standing for both Scapegoat which had become a staple of the format, and greatest of all time, as many do refer to this period as one of the best Yu-Gi-Oh formats to ever exist. SJC Charlotte would be held just two weeks later on June 25th, 2005, and it would run with the meta shifts from New Jersey prior, with first place being Anthony Alvarado on Chaos, playing the newly popularized Metamorphosis with Scapegoat for access to Thousand Eyes Restrict. J. Kim would take second place here with an interesting list compared to the meta, Zombie. His list would include no chaos monsters, and would instead be focused on the interaction of Pyramid Turtle with Vampire Lord to control the game. Book of Life here would also majorly shine thanks to its ability to banish pieces of the opponent's chaos core from the game, similarly to how Kaiku was used previously. SJC Seattle would take place soon after on July 9th, 2005, and once again chaos would be back on top, taking first and second place piloted by Osman Ortiz and Robert Leem respectively. Osman's unique card for his build was Guardian KS, who couldn't be summoned normally, but could be set, and once she's faced up, she can't be targeted for attacks and is unaffected by spells, essentially becoming a nearly unbeatable monster in the current format. Go Control had solidified itself as a meta mainstay with these results, and more and more people had gravitated towards the Metamorphosis and Scapegoat package for their decks, which would only be bolstered by the reprint set that soon followed. Dark Beginning Volume 2 Release Date July 27th, 2005 Set Type Reprint set. Major strategies, various pieces from 2002 to 2003. Impact, the calm before the storm. With Dark Beginning 2, players would once again be given a chance to grab meta staples, this time in the forms of Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer, Bazoo the Soul Eater, Blade Knight, Mirror Force, Graceful Charity, and the first ever easy access prints of Cyberstein, the SJC prize card, and Morphing Jar, whose only printings until now were in tournament packs. 
While this made the format easier to get into, this is a bit of a send-off for the DM era in general, as less than a month later, the next major core set would release, and with it would be the new pinnacle of card design and what a card needed to be to be playable. Cybernetic Revolution. Release date, August 17th, 2005. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Cyber, Vehicroid, Hero. Impact, The Future of Card Design. It's no exaggeration to say that Cybernetic Revolution truly did revolutionize the game as a whole, essentially recontextualizing what a card had to be in order to be considered good moving forward. This was entirely thanks to Cyber Dragon, a level 5, 2100 attack monster that could be special summoned if you controlled no monsters while your opponent did, which would take some time, but would slowly become a staple in literally every deck in the format. Cyber Dragon being such a value card for almost no investment changed the threshold for powerful monsters immediately, as it could contest literally any no tribute monster in the format, could be used as tribute fodder for a more powerful threat like Jinzo or Mobius, and to top it all off was a light monster for the Chaos Core to abuse. Arguably the best light target for the core ever printed since DD Warrior Lady usually didn't stay in the graveyard. On top of this, Cyber Dragon brought with it two fusions in Cyber Twin and Cyber End Dragon, the former being a fusion of two Cyber Dragons that could attack twice in a turn, and the latter being a fusion of three with piercing damage. These two would recontextualize the power of Cyber Stein, making the former prize card into an absolute powerhouse threat in the format as you could now trade 5,000 life points for a monster that could end the game on the spot. However, this wasn't really known at first. Cyberstein would go on to be a completely unknown card in the metagame, even though all the pieces to make it extremely powerful were just sitting there. Beyond these threats, a lot of minor additions to the card pool would also be included here, such as Cyrus's Viacroids, which had almost no connective tissue between them and did nothing overall outside of Drillroid, who destroyed any defense position monster it attacked, which saw play in various decks as a new staple piece. Hero would receive Bubble Man, who could special summon itself from hand if it was the last card there, and Miracle Fusion, the first ever spell that let you fusion summon using materials in the graveyard. This release would sort of establish the main theme with hero archetypes for a long period of time. They were the testing ground for new fusion themes and concepts before moving them out to more general strategies. A perfect example of this was Miracle Fusion, which was also released alongside Dragon's Mirror, which had the same effect except it was for Dragon Fusion monsters. These two would be the start of various archetypes and strategies getting similar fusion spells as time went on, though would also both have their own meta implications later, but for very different reasons. SJC Indianapolis would take place three days later on August 20th, 2005, and the full gravity of these releases would take quite a while to really impact the meta, as for the time being, most players were opting to just continue playing decks as they were previously. First and second place would be taken by Goat Control variants, piloted by Nareg Tarosian and Michael Fukuyama respectively, neither of whom were playing the new cards from Cybernetic Revolution. In retrospect, Cyber Dragon and Cyber Stein were absolutely ready to take over the meta, they would just need to be discovered first. With yet another SJC in the books, most players looked forward to the next big release, even if it was mostly reprints, as there were a few cards worth opening for. Collectible Tins 2005 Release date, September 1st, 2005 Set type, Yearly Tins Major Strategies, The Last Packs of the DM Era Impact, A Single Relevant Promo The tins of yesteryear were a good bit different than how the yearly tin releases work now. Back then, rather than a mega pack including the best parts of the previous year's sets, the tins would simply include one of each pack from the block that they're reprinting. However, the tins back then also each had a promo that was completely new, resulting in six new cards being released although a few of them were just simply new alternate art variants, like Dark Magician Girl. The only new promo that had any impact here was Xerian Universe, an 1800 dark monster that could drop its attack by 400 for the turn to deal piercing damage, which became an occasional slot in for Chaos variants looking for a counter to scapegoat. 
This was clearly on display with SJC Boston taking place just over a week later on September 10th of 2005, where both first and second place finishes would be on Chaos with Xerian Universe included, being Brian Long and Brian Coronal respectively. Long was also on a card that would become extremely popular for dealing with Scapegoat, being Azura Priest, a spirit monster that could attack each monster the opponent controlled once each, being useful for clearing out a board of sheep tokens in a single sweep. Similarly, Air Knight Parshath had also started to pick up popularity for a similar reason to Xerian Universe, as the ability to deal piercing damage through the tokens was becoming increasingly ideal to players. Coronal's list, however, was one of the first major successes to include Cyber Dragon in their list, which would only become more and more common as the format evolved, partially sped up by the next ban list update. The ban list was updated on October 1st of 2005, and with this update came the arguable end of the chaos era of the game. Blackluster Soldier, Sinister Serpent, Tribe Infecting Virus, Delinquent Duo, Graceful Charity, Pot of Greed, Mirror Force, and Ring of Destruction were all now banned in one fell swoop, removing some of the most powerful cards of the format from the game for an extremely long period of time, some even remaining on the ban list from this hit to this day. Newly limited were Magician of Faith, Night Assailant, Thousand Eyes Restrict, Tsukiyomi, Book of Moon, Book of Taiyu, Confiscation, Dark Hole, Limiter Removal, Metamorphosis, Nobleman of Crossout, Scapegoat, and Exchange of the Spirit. Most of these hits targeted at the theme of flip control that had become pervasive in the current format, along with the power of the Goat Control Core. Lastly, Chick the Yellow, Marauding Captain, and Vampire Lord were all released from this list, as their semi-limited status didn't really affect their power levels all too much. SJC Atlanta would be the first real display of these changes on October 8th of 2005, just a week after the changes went into effect. The first place finish from John Jensen being Chaos seemed a little odd at first with all the hits that just took place, but a good portion of the deck was more so focused on general control pieces like the various good warrior pieces, like DD Assailant, Warrior Lady, Exiled Force, and Mystic Swordsman Level 2. In addition to this, while BLS was now banned, Chaos Sorcerer was still legal, giving a less powerful option to use for Chaos pushes. Daniel Fitzgerald would take second place with Phoenix Burn, mostly being the same deck just with more burn options thanks to Wave Motion Cannon. Both of these players were on a single copy of Cyber Dragon, and this was a bit of a contentious point as it was growing in the player base that two to three copies of the powerhouse may actually be ideal moving forward, though discussion of this was mostly on the old Pojo forums rather than being reflected in actual results. With a new format having a few weeks to steep, the next wave of reprints would be given to the masses, making the newly opened format that much more accessible. Dark Revelation Volume 2, release date October 20th, 2005, set type, reprint set, major strategies, the chaos bosses, impact, weren't these cards just banned? Dark Revelation Volume 2 was a bit of a head scratcher of a set, as its main two draws, being Blackluster Soldier and Chaos Emperor Dragon reprints, were already banned, making the main chase cards of the set completely unusable in the current metagame. That wasn't to say that there was nothing from this set. Far from it, with reprints of popular meta cards like Berserk Gorilla, Freed the Brave Warrior, Chaos Sorcerer, Demok, Saborg, and Night Assailant, there were cards to get here, just not nearly as much for the meta as the previous reprint sets. This one unfortunately came out at the exact wrong time to be well received, and it didn't even have a lot of time in the market as the new product, as just over a week later the next structure deck would be released. Warrior's Triumph, release date, October 28th, 2005. Set type, Structure Deck. Major Strategies, Warrior. Impact, Reprinting the Meta Kings and Queens. Similarly to other Structure Decks of the era, the new card of Warrior's Triumph, being Guilford the Legend, did practically nothing to the metagame at large, but it did provide some of the most significant reprints we have received thus far. Exiled Force, DD Warrior Lady, Mystic Swordsman Level 2, Ninja Grandmaster Sasuke, Snatch Steel, Mystical Space Typhoon, Giant Trunade, Heavy Storm, Rhoda, Lightning Vortex, and Call of the Haunted were all reprinted here, with some of these getting their first ever non-foil reprint, making them far more accessible to newer players. 
This release was followed up by SJC Chicago in the same weekend on October 29th, 2005, being the first SJC without Cyberstein as the prize card, being replaced by Des Volskoff for the next year of play. Dale Bolito would take first place with yet another Chaos Brew, but very much more notably playing two Cyber Dragons, finally punctuating the power of the recent monster. Carlos Santiago's second place deck would similarly be on two of Cyber Dragon, notably dropping the Chaos Monsters in their entirety to place more focus on the new up-and-coming threat in the meta, Spirit Reaper. With so many of the big removal pieces of the format now either limited or banned, Reaper was growing in popularity as an extremely difficult monster to out in the moment. Santiago's inclusion of three in his deck would speak to its value as a battle blocker and game staller, and this would only grow with future events. With Cyber Dragon and Spirit Reaper's growing popularity, many look to the next major core set to bring a couple more pieces to really shake up the meta after the last ban list. Elemental Energy Release date, November 16th, 2005. Set type, core set. Major strategies, chemical, dark world. Impact, diversifying the staple pool. Elemental energy, while not bringing anything nearly as powerful as Cyber Dragon, was still a solid set for its era. Continuing the theme of bringing in decks used in the GX anime, Bastion's chemical monsters would be released here, most notably including Hydro Gedon, who summons another copy of itself from deck when it destroys a monster in battle. This was an extremely cheap and effective way to swarm your board at the time when board swarming was more limited than it had been previously, and Hydro Gedon's 1600 attack body was actually a decent amount of bulk to trigger its effect, seeing play from time to time in decks that could enable it. Dark World was probably one of the most notable releases here, a series of monsters that gained powerful effects if discarded by card effect, and even more so if discarded by the opponents, including Beige, who special summons itself, Brow, who draws a card, or two if discarded by the opponent, and Silva, who special summons itself and makes the opponent shuffle back two cards from hand if discarded by the opponent. However, these effects were rather difficult to trigger at first due to most of the good discard-related spells, like Graceful Charity, now being banned, and with hand-ripping effects at an all-time low, the opponent discarding your cards was even less likely. However, there was a niche for these cards, which allowed them to mostly see side deck tech play against specific strategies, like Empty Jar, but those were exceedingly rare at the time. Arguably the best card released here was Pot of Avarice, which let you shuffle back five monsters from Grave to draw two cards, being essentially a pot of greed that required some setup. This card was decently popular in its time, though a little situational, but would grow far more popular as the game continues to speed up, making Grave Recycling a bit more powerful than initially thought. A second SJC would take place in Los Angeles three days later on November 19th, 2005, and with it, the power of both Cyber Dragon and Spirit Reaper were rapidly taking over the meta. First place was taken by Paul Levitin with a Bazoo Return strategy, notably playing a copy of DD Survivor in the main deck, as it was a powerful counter to the various DD assailants and warrior ladies running around the event. Angel Flores would take second with Warrior Beatdown notably also playing two Cyber Dragon and two Spirit Reaper, as well as playing the one DD Survivor. It was becoming more and more important for decks at the time to have some way to out the Spirit Reaper on the board without committing any removal options, which led to the increasing popularity of Drillroid and Mystic Swordsman Level 2, both of which saw play in the first and second place lists respectively. SJC San Francisco would take place just under a month later on December 10th, 2005, being the final SJC of the year, and it would solidify the new meta trends. The Lee Luna would take first place with the deck mostly comprised of the new staples we've mentioned in a pseudo control strategy, having upped their count of Cyber Dragon to the maximum three copies. Michael Bueno would take second with a Chaos build, very interestingly playing two Chaos Sorcerers and, most notably, three Dekoichi, who provided Bueno with a dark name in the grave for Sorcerer as well as an additional draw power on Flip. This would round out the 2005 competitive year and would set the stage for the year to follow. Cyber Dragon and Spirit Reaper had fully risen as the new kings of the meta, with Cyberstein present and just waiting to be discovered. Chaos had also fallen from its once high pedestal, and from its ashes more and more generalized decks have emerged. As the GX era will progress, more packs may bring fewer changes in themselves, but player innovation will continue to shape just how far the game itself can be pushed. 
Thank you all for watching to the very end of this video. In case you missed the announcement, I now have a Patreon to help make these videos a little bit more regularly. Anyone who backs me on Patreon will have access to my video essays the day before they come up on YouTube. A big shout out to our first $5 plus patron, Prinrin, and all of our other backers on Patreon. Link for that will be down in the description if you're interested. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe below. Every little bit helps. If you want more info for the behind the scenes for these, be sure to follow me on Twitter or check out my Twitch streams whenever they happen. Both links are down in the description below. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next time.